Well, hello everyone in YouTube land. I'm joined here by Justin from Playing Board Games. And I'm sure you know Justin already, but as the name of his channel implies, uh, Playing Board Games is a YouTube channel wherein people are playing board games all the time. And, and just, Justin, you're basically in all of them, right? Are, are you in every video? I'm in pretty much, like there's some that I'm not in, but yeah, I'm pretty much in every video, yeah. Anyway, the channel has provided daily Arkham Core, the uh, card game content since probably around 2020 or so, right? Yeah. But you've yeah. been playing uh, on the channel since the, the game started, and there's some old uh, streams out there from like 2017 of you guys playing Dunwich, which is always a, a blast to just go look at. I know you've done that before to revisit some of your old gameplay. Um, so you've got over like 19,000 subscribers on the channel, over 200 list videos now, like pushing 250, right? Yeah, yeah. I think we're at like 237 around there. Wow. And hundreds and hundreds of hours of gameplay to watch like if you were to just put on a playlist or something of all of your gameplay i don't know how long it go on for like months maybe yeah probably <laughs> i actually don't even know either <laughs> it would be a long time it'd be kind of crazy to think right that someone's mm. out there who's just like okay we're gonna spend the next month watching a lot of arkham please, yeah. please. <laughs> uh anyway but to me and probably to many others justin is the voice of arkham horror the card game if you've watched any of uh, your content um you've learned a lot about the game about the experiences and probably a lot of your experiences are also justin's experiences it kind of goes like hand in hand you learn a lot about the game and, and how cards work and and what seems to be strong what seems to be to be not so strong um if you've been hankering to build a father mateo deck in the past month or so that thought is not your own it is probably a little justin in the back of your head who has given you this idea <laughs> So today I just wanted to talk to Justin a little bit and uh, go over some of your thoughts and experiences about yourself as a player, some things that you may not feel as comfortable just saying, I'm talking about this on my own, on my own channel, but in an interview with, with me on someone else's channel, uh, you can be a little bit more introspective and, and hype up, um, you know, what, what you think about the game. Mostly I'm, I'm dividing this into basically three sections. One is about you as a player and your your play style um two is more about the game itself your experiences uh with scenarios and campaigns and then lastly a maybe short section about your your channel and what you how you do the channel and, and what's coming up next so without uh, further ado i think i can jump into it i gave justin a little bit of a preview of these questions already so he could have some idea what to talk about but there's a few secret questions that are potentially follow-ups just to keep you on your toes <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm excited all right so the first thing is how would you classify yourself as an arkham player and what does that mean i know there's lots of terms that people have used from magic the gathering um but i'm not sure i don't know if you've done a video on this of like how to classify these in arkham terms so maybe this is a first little foray into that but you've played magic i honestly have not really my, my background in card games is not from the uh ccgs or, or tcgs for that matter um so yeah just give us a little primer on on that and and where you uh, see yourself on on the uh, the classification list yeah so um for people who don't know we haven't done a video we've talked about it in like samplings and other videos but there's three major types of players um, that come from Mark Rosewater, the head designer of Magic for the last, like, forever. Um, and one of them is Timmy, which is, like, you like big, splashy things. An example of this in Arkham is Flurry of Blows from Scarlet Keys. Um, there's Johnnies, who like to build around combos or things that, if you, if someone, look, if you look at a card and someone online says this card sucks and your instinct is, I can make this card work, uh, you're probably a Johnny. And an example of that is Sled Dogs, that's a pretty common one for that. And then there are Spikes, who like to win and they play to win and the cards that excite the most are usually the ones that are most efficient a good example of this is uh strong armed or match uh matchbox in the new um hemlock expansion and i contrary to what people always say i am a spike i only want to win um and i like to win and uh the definition of these in arkham are, are very different so like um with with spikes it's kind of like one of those things because arkham's card pool is so open it's not the same as um magic the gathering in some ways but 
it's like trying to win with what you have available to you. And that's kind of like what I've graduated into. I used to just be like, I want to play the same deck every time. But now that um, my new favorite thing to do in Arkham is elaborate challenges, it's kind of like, how do I win with these handicaps against me? So it's like, it's like that kind of thing. But I like to win. I love to win. <laughs> and I like boring cards that help me win. Those are my favorite cards. So what's a good example of an investigator or deck that you've played that is a good example of this? Uh, probably most recently, it was that Harvey Walters deck I brought with Eric uh, in Path to Carcosa. Um, that deck went so hard. I did not, I underestimated how hard that deck was going to go. Um, That's the one with the Ancient Stones, I, I think, right? Yeah, the Ancient Stone, yeah. It also had Untabooed um, Mr. Rook, which is a very powerful card. Um, yeah, and then also, like, um, a lot of my Silas decks end up being very spiky. Um, the reason why I like him is because he is just pure value. Um, and he, I, I think that he is... He's a quiet spike investigator i don't see a lot of other people talk about him but i think he is incredibly strong in the right hands and i mean i mean i think that's true for a lot of arkham there's a lot of um if you have experience in an investigator you're going to do better and i have a lot of experience in silas so i'm a little bit skewed by that but i think that harvey walters deck would be my answer to that question that deck was nuts so as far as the other play styles go given that you've done these other challenges and you've played every investigator probably a lot of them many many times uh, do you ever dabble in these other mentalities and how do you approach that? Um, I don't, I, I think, yeah, I think everyone, they do dabble into the other, the things I think like everyone's a little bit of everything. Like, um, I think everyone has a bit of a Timmy at heart. This Travis is a Timmy. Like he, he, like he's more spike, like Travis is a spike too. Bryn's a Johnny for the mm. three of us, a dynamic. Um, I can't speak for you, but you feel like you kind of fall into like the Johnny and spike category. Yeah. Um, but I think I too, like, I think I used to be Spike Timmy, but now I'm a little bit more Spike Johnny because, um, we'll, we'll get to this later because I, I know the questions, but part of the play all card challenge really opened my eyes to what the Arkham card pool could do. And it's one of those things where it's less like, um, I need to prove that this card is good, but it's like the knowledge of, I know this card is good because the, I, the, the definition of what a card is and what you want from it changes depending on what your deck is trying to do. So um, definitely like that is kind of like my approach now where I'm like, I'm definitely like on like the Johnny side of things too. I, I, I know I can make it work, but it's less like trying to prove that it can work. It's just like, I know it can work. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So how much of this also plays into your preferred, um, I want to say format because it's a term you just used this week, but the fact that you guys usually play three player you play a lot of two player and pretty much just on standard difficulty. Uh, I think it makes it possible to have fun. <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to sound mean to Arkham, um, but I think hard and expert are kind of, um, they don't work. I don't think they function in the way that um, was originally intended in terms of things. Like, I, I think I'll give hard a bigger pass than like expert. I think expert is kind of just fundamentally broken. <laughs> in the sense that you're not playing the same Arkham Horror that was the intention of the design. I'd much rather if Expert was, um, for example, the tokens were similar to hard or even standard, but, like, the deck was harder, right? Like, you would include, like, an Ancient Evils that surged, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, it changed, like, the tempo of the game. But it doesn't. So it's, like, one of those things that we play on standard for that reason. It's because it allows us to, um, instead of just doing a deck where we discover clues instead of investigating we have that those those dramatic moments where i um in dream eaters when we're playing the dog campaign i use testing sprint and sniff five locations right because like that's more fun than us just being like i'll discover a clue discover a clue which is what hard and expert kind of starts to force out of you again more expert than hard but still yeah i, I agree with that i've never even tried expert it doesn't sound like mm -hmm. it doesn't really do what I want to do with the game. And sometimes I wonder how much they, they play test it. I also agree with you with the, I'm going to try not to answer these questions myself too. This is all about you. Um, but I just wanted to chime in and say that I just wish that they would play with the difficulty levers in, in some different ways. If you choose, you know, hard or expert rather than just the, the tokens, which, um, yeah, I've been, 
I've been slowly for the last three years poking at a custom campaign, and that's what I'm doing in that. I'm making it so that Hardened Expert are not actually token bag, but just um, like more difficult encounter cards or decisions you have to make in the game. Mm -hmm. They've tried a couple times. I know that there's a couple of uh, scenarios where they had you have you add uh, extra doom to begin. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine, but they could do better. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of those things that it's nice to see them explore it, but I'd love for them to explore it more. Like, I would love it if the token bag was like, you open up uh, Drowned City and the token bag, you look at Expert and you're like, this looks exactly like hard. And then you're like, oh, they're doing something here. That's what I want to see. Ooh. Yeah. And then the other reality is that even on, on easy or standard, sometimes the token bag can be a total mess. It can be yep, yeah. just as yeah, bad yeah. In, in many cases. Depends on the scenario and what, what happens. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm also like, uh, I, I don't think, I think they made a mistake calling easy, easy. They should have called a narrative from the, like, the get-go. This is, like, the narrative difficulty. Uh, and I also think standard is plenty difficult. Um, unless you're trying to break it free, like, gloves off. Then mm -hmm. it's pretty, um, it's pretty manageable. But I think that's more about the cards, player cards are just so freaking good these days. So, let me go back to the original part of the question. It, you've played a lot of two-handed solo Yep. two player uh two actual two player and then three player for the bulk of your uh your gameplay and some four player when you do patron game day or mm -hmm. um well basically just that what's the difficulty difference in your mind for those different formats four player is literally a vacation like it's uh it's i think it's it's probably pretty common sentiment that the game gets easier the more players you add um uh, and also, the game gets more fun <laughs> the more players you add. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, I've tried True Solo. I know you're doing True Solo on your cha uh, your channel. And I've mm -hmm. been like, people be like, do True Solo. And now, luckily, I can just be like, look, Daniel's doing that. Go watch that. Because I hate it. I hate True Solo. Um, it's uh, two-handed is very fun and, like, the difficulty I like. Three-player is starts to get, like, still difficult because you're actually at that weird point where... Um, Every effect that hits three or four players is hitting you, but you only have three. Um, but you're allowed to now do a fun deck. Like, I, I don't like playing Mystics a two-player, but a three-player, I love Mystics, right? Same with four-player. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of the thing where it gets easier with the more players you have playing, I think, anyway. Yeah. I, I wish people talked more about the, the player count mm -hmm. change on the game. I mean, even just the player cards themselves are, are quite different in terms yep. of their impact, but... I ha my my main in person group is three player just like yours and sometimes I I don't know I I, I go through the scenarios and I'm like wow that was great and then I play it again in two player or two handed yeah. solo and I'm like what yeah. what's going on here this is like a completely different scenario which kind of rolls into the next question I want to take or talk about which is when you read about what people say about the game in general is there anything that you've when you read you're like what are they talking about this is, sounds like they're playing a different game than what I experienced. Given that you play so much, I, I imagine you have had all of the different experiences, but have you ever read something where you're like, something is is totally foreign to me? Um, I never trust an opinion when they say that Rex Murphy isn't strong. That's the first one that comes up. Yep. Um, and like the reason for this is... Uh, just like, like every time someone points to like this is what this person can do to get the level of tempo that rex has like so they're better than rex but i just my brain when i read that i think but rex doesn't need it <laughs> like rex doesn't need all those extra steps to get rex like a good example is daisy walker i think is a very strong investigator and everyone was like with grim memoir she's better than rex with grim memoir she's has rex's ability right like she can do other things but she's like getting that extra clue and drawing a card so the value is like different but like on paper it's like you're getting the same sort of similar tempo you're getting to rex murphy both very strong both can do great things but like it's one of those things where just like i played rex and he won me the scenarios like if you get a, a, a an extra clue every turn just for playing the game is incredible and i think this kind of comes back to also like my my spike sentiment which is um, how much value can I get by putting in as little as possible, right? Like it's like putting into like a claw machine, right? If I win my toy on the first dollar I spend, like that's what I'm trying to achieve every time. If I have to spend $5 to win a toy, I need to get away from that claw machine. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. All right. Um, that, yeah, cool. go ahead. 
sorry, another thing is too, is that this one is a little bit, it's not really about the gameplay. Um, but I've never really had like the opportunity to talk about this on our own channel about things that I read online. Um, and I just have to like, I'm going to put my flag down, but I've been starting to get really antsy about the sentiment online, which is that it's a co-op game. So you can house rule and play as you want for it's like, here's a ruling I don't enjoy. I want to house rule this and not play with that instead. I feel like, um, while a lot of this falls on FFG to make the rules tighter, and like kind of like that have like a source that's more updated um and also i think ffg shouldn't respond to email rulings but that's a whole different conversation uh i think players also need to take accountability to ensure the dialogue of the game remains approachable for all players and i think that as soon as we start like because as soon as we start like making it okay for like this idea that if you don't like a rule just house rule it you have to put a, ca a caveat into every online discourse you read where it's like is this person actually playing with uh, a rule that they get to have eight cards in their opening hand all the time, right? Like, it's like one of those things are like, they like don't play with this one rule because they don't like it. And then it's just like, it, it, it kind of just muddies the water. And I personally think can slow the growth of the game in the long term. Yeah, no, I totally understand that, especially since you do get, uh, you, you have your own discord, right? So you do get a lot of different people who want to have a beef with something or other or want to tell people about a story that they've had and, and this kind of bubbles up a bit more than than otherwise i mean youtube comments in general also you get all kinds of people just want to say something they, they've got something yeah. off their chest and that's the place for them to do it um so we can talk about the the online discourse it becomes you know when you say something not you but the commenters it gets read right this is your exposure to the community and it's hard to know like what fantasy flight game can take from that right are they reading this or what kind of feedback are they getting i sure hope that they are getting some pushback about the the email rulings too because uh, I, I think they are meant as responses to emails but then they get publicized and suddenly yes. they're exposed and that's yeah. if they if they wanted to make these rulings public they need to make them public themselves Yes. Yep. And that's why like we did the shift back in the, I'm pretty sure it was the practice makes perfect. Um, heyday where it was practice makes perfect. The King in yellow. Mm -hmm. That's when we decided to just do FAQ and ignore email rulings. And it was honestly the best choice we made on the channel in like a long time. Probably the next best choice was list videos. Um, <laughs> but, um, that was like a big shift for not only my sanity of not having to like keep up with that stuff, but also I think it, it made our dialogue around the game smoother because we didn't have to like worry about any of that stuff. And it made like a consistent home. And it also is like um, something that someone else can point to. It's like, what do I pay attention to? You pay attention to the rule book and the FAQ and you go from there. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's move on to, I think you have a lot of uh, catchphrases almost um, <laughs> on the channel. Every time I, I am playing Insmith and I, I have a little just in my head as well when I have an on and engage effect. And I think about, I'm engaging this deep one to be wed, since that's yeah. something you always say. <laughs> but... I, I, do, I do say that. Even when you said engaged, I was like, to be wed, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but something you talk about a lot, I think, in, in recent videos about deck tech and whatnot is about the value you get out of cards. And then sometimes even like value upon value. I just wanted you to uh, maybe talk about that more. What do you mean? What do you see when you look at a card and a combination in terms of getting value out of it? This was, I was having a tough time when I was thinking about this one. It's like to actually put it into words because value upon value um, kind of just feels like um, it's a feeling more than like something that I think can be easily described. But I, I think putting it into words, a good way to think of it is that are you getting like two cards worth of value out of one card, right? So like, um, say for example, you play, let's just go to like Norman Withers. Cause this was the kind of like, when I was thinking about my value upon value, I thought of a deck that I built with Norman Withers to take through Oz. Um, no, not Oz, sorry. Uh, Alice in Wonderland. Um, that, that one, I want a beard's many great custom campaigns. And uh, I had a divination in play divination in play. I think there's value. You get three you get uh, you get how many is this? there's six charges on the level four, yeah. on the level four so you get six clues like that's easy to see that's the value that you immediately see but now every time you refill that divination you're like not having to spend actions playing that divination or alternatively you're just 
playing, quote unquote, another version of that divination. Then you go with Norman Withers and he has his signature that allows you to put a card from your hand on top of your deck. You have Astronomical Atlas to um, like um, just play it again, like to like to uh, put that card on top of your deck, put it like just loop it. The, uh, the, the Astronomical Atlas Norman loop. You use that with like a ghastly possession. You're refilling that divination for over and over and over again. Um, and it's just like value on value, right? Like you're just like, you're, you're like literally just making an unstoppable machine of that kind of stuff. Another one is this Kohaku deck that I'm playing through. Um, what is it? What's the, I forget the name, the custom campaign about time travel. What's that one called? Uh, ages unwound ages yeah. unwound that's the one yeah but with old man i'm getting older the old man in my brain takes a few more seconds to go through the library to find the information i need soon you will um, be norm withers too exactly yeah <laughs> um but so i'm playing a kohaku deck where i built around As ancient covenant and read the signs to use my book to basically just refill a living ink uh draw uh, gain cards or resources with jewel of areolas uh you uh get the read the signs back into my hand um trigger the ancient covenant so i can pass one test each turn and just keep going like that and just the imag the value that that drips is just like insane over time and like it's it's one of those things where like the idea of tempo i think tempo is hard to kind of fully understand when you just look at it logistically in arkham but i think tempo really comes into the feeling of it if you have played a deduction and you get an extra clue you feel good and like that's where like the tempo um comes in and how you're like you don't know it but you're getting ahead of the game so it's like one of those things where you you play a card and you're like i, I that one card did all that is kind of like where that comes into play mm -hmm. do you feel like it's somewhat of a like a building an engine that you're talking about where you're getting more out of the this the pieces and and that's kind of catapulting you forward or is it a little bit different yeah, yeah I, th I think that's like a good way like uh, if you build your engine um it's like that's the easiest way to see it but i do think that value on value is also um something that you can see on a smaller scale because the reality is is i'm actually there was a long time on the channel i was known as the guy who never played assets right like i just like played one card <laughs> And I, I, I use that one card the whole game. But like value on value can even scale down to smaller things. Like a good example of that is Unrelenting and Silas Marsh. Silas Marsh can use Unrelenting to draw cards and then pull it back into my hand. That's kind of like why I like Silas. Because skill cards are powerful because you can play them once. We've been joking on our, our Discord a lot that they are events that you don't pay for, right? And they are, right? Like skills are basically just events that you don't pay for. Um, and if you're able to play a skill over and over and over again, that one card is going to keep seeing value and it's just going to keep spiraling out of control, which is why Unrelenting is so good in Silas Marsh, because it just means that you basically, your hand is full when you need it to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like a lot of cards have that secret extra component where you can use them more than once or you get... Mm, I, even as like a single card in your deck, there's a lot of juice that it actually, that comes out of the card. Um, I mm -hmm. feel like the doubles are kind of fun because they only take up one deck slot and yep. you do a lot with them, right? Yep. And that allows you to get so much more out of the one, well, two actions, but the one card that you're playing with. Um, so that's maybe even a smaller scale than you're talking about. But, um, but no, but I, but I think you're 100% right, because if we look at Task Force as a yes. card, right? Like Task Force is a very efficient card. And if you use it to just say, for example, they activate and they do a lock picks, right? For their action, that's pretty good. But like, let's say if they did like a divination four as an mm -hmm. example, just going back, right? Like there's so much more incremental value that you get out of that. And that's like where you can kind of like look at it as a metric of how much value can I get out of my cards, just like going from the different things that can play out about it. And that's what I think task force is a great example, because I also agree the double cards, I think as a whole are pretty actually impressive. Um, and I think task force is quietly one of the most efficient ones of them. And it's fun. It feels like you're a champ when you make it do something more than what it just looks like on the, the text. So, yep. all right. Um, so the next questions are kind of about strategy that you've, uh, you have, or that you've kind of read about or thought about what's your, what's something about the game, maybe advice or strategy that you think is underrated or underappreciated in the community as a whole. Um, so 
I, to start this, I actually have to talk about what is said a lot. So, cause it's going to kind of lead into that, but there's a lot of talk about tempo and you know, what you need to do to win the game on like the macro level. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think things that I see, and I even see this a lot, um, I'm not saying I'm quietly watching and judging like patron game days or stuff like that. But like it's I see this on like the smaller scale from people who aren't as lucky enough to me be able to do this as a nine to five job. Right. Where um, it's the micro decisions that add up. Um, this is an example that um, I always point to. You have to think ahead to your next turn or two turns down the road because Arkham is a game where you have to always be on your toes because the deck is going to give you some sort of challenge, right? And you need to think about what would happen if something bad happened. And the example of this is there was a, we did on our channel, a how deep can you go? Where we, I challenged patrons as groups to um, play Depths of Yoth to see who got the lowest, the deepest in standalone mode. Yes, and you you are, well, you, who was, the, who was here on your team for the winner for that one? Uh, I was Kaimani, and the other person was yeah. Ursula. We did not win. Yeah. We got second place. You got second place? Oh, I thought you won. You guys, I think you guys, you got points, though. I think you guys got, like, the, 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 I, the my choice winner, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm not bitter, but the team that won got the extra victory point from York Signature. Mm, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. But in one of the ones, um, there was a player who had um, Spectral Razor in their hand. And they were at zero resources. And for their last action, they drew a card instead of gaining a resource. Um, we say that like drawing a card and gaining a resource is the, one of the worst actions you can take. We say that in the sense of scaling across the entire game. If you take too many draw a card or gain a resource actions, you are going to fall behind. Find that efficiency elsewhere. However, it's totally fine to take draw or cards or resource actions occasionally throughout the game. I feel like uh, I see that a lot of people think we're, we mean never take them, but just like don't take them too much. But this person, um, instead of gaining a resource to go to one, which would allow them to go to two during the upkeep to play their Spectral Razor next turn in case they drew an enemy, um, drew, drew a card instead, right? So it's like that little choice matters a lot. And you might think, but what, how can it matter? The next turn, that player drew a three health enemy that they could not kill because of that. And they lost so much tempo. They had to take an attack of opportunity mm -hmm. to get the, the resource to play Spectral Razor. And just that small thing of thinking ahead, looking at your hand, seeing what's to come. And just instead of drawing the card, gaining the resource to turn on your Spectral Razor is, I think, some it's just small little examples of how looking ahead will help you win more. So this is my pitch for everyone who's still watching at this point. I know gameplay videos don't get a lot of eyeballs on them, but that is also how you learn. Like our advice in the theoretical sense is good, I think, mm -hmm. but putting into practice is something you need to watch people do. And you're talking about this challenge where you could see their hand because you, you were playing as the, uh, the, the black game seat. So you could see everyone and you can think about, okay, would I make those decisions the same way? And I, I do that as well when I watch anyone's uh, streamed uh, videos. I, I think about what would I do on this turn and see if they do the same thing. And then what are the consequences? Sometimes I'm wrong, sometimes I'm right. But you learn a lot about what the game throws at you as a result of your actions. Yeah, 100%. Um, it's, it's, it's great advice for like if you're trying to get better at a competitive game, but it also translates if you're trying to get better at a cooperative game. Um, because like seeing how and trying to solve the puzzle each turn is really, is really important, but also just like, again, yeah, they're not viewed as much, but you, sh they are like, we try to make them as entertaining as we can for you and give our thought process. I think they are, if you want to, especially if it's a campaign you just played and you're like that challenged me or even just a scenario, right? You can probably find the scenario and just like watch that and be like, oh, this is how they handled that. Oh, I did that all the time. When I first played through, I would you know, play a scenario with my group and then go back and watch you guys and see what happened with you. Sometimes also to see if we got a rule wrong or you guys did, but <laughs> sometimes the wording is very usually confusing. Us, we, we, uh... <laughs> or, or both of us. I, I, that, there's definitely cases where the wording was confusing. And I was like, you know what, let's just go see what someone else did. And, and maybe there was some discussion about it that I missed. Yeah. Anyway, so flip side is uh, what's some stuff that you've seen that people overemphasize in your opinion as far as 
strategy or or tactics? Um, I think a big thing is that um, assuming the dialogue is open for you have an entire collection or most of the collection, um, any uh, the idea that like an investigator sucks now, I think is incorrect. I think there's like worse investigators, right? I think that's just the, that's an unavoidable part of power levels in games. Like it's where we it's not like me trying to say hurt someone's feelings by saying I think that Amina is currently like one of the weaker investigators, right? Um but I think that she's missing pieces that makes her on the level, but she's playable. I think she's functional. I think she can be strong with the right setup. Um I think it's just as always it takes more to set them up on that likewise um i think that just like i don't know actually I, I i lost that thought but that's the big thing we're just that um an investigator is unplayable is probably the advice that i think is kind of the, the thing that i disagree with most now because the player card pool is insanely strong and i think for people who haven't explored it fully don't realize how strong it actually is it's crazy right uh, it's actually like it's my like red flag to watch right now where i'm just like how much more can this actually take before there needs to be some sort of official system to provide a more closed card pool so this is uh i bought uh... I don't know if you've noticed this, but I almost have two years on my channel and I don't have a tier list on the investigators. It's just not something I'm comfortable doing still. And part of it is exactly your your point when people say, uh, talk about the investigators in such absolutes. I don't know how to make a tier list to be, because you're, you're really, at this point, it's about the cards that you have access to and if you can make them work with the investigator. And they're all playable. Yes, some of them are stronger than others. I'm not going to... Uh, deny that but what do you mean when you make the different tiers even if you explain it mm -hmm. and say that you know s tier and a plus or whatever you call them are not that far away from each other you're still splitting hairs in, in, in my mind um but people will look at that and say i can't believe you didn't rank them number one like what? yeah <laughs> yeah and that's like because like I, I totally get that sentiment of like not being able to make like like a tier list right because it's it is just splitting hairs like i totally like get that luckily i'm very i'm i, I it's a, it's a hobby of mine splitting hairs i'm just like naturally ranking <laughs> things in my head but it really comes down to like that's something that we, we we try to push is that these are our opinions right and it's like our definition of power level and that's why for me my definition is just how long how many pieces do i need to get this investigator moving to the level that i that I, I want to achieve. Yeah. But it's certainly at standard difficulty, especially at three or four players. Oh, you, every, anyone can work. You can win anything. It, it, it is, yep. I mean, the game is still challenging, but that doesn't mean that the investigator was at fault in yeah, many and cases. I'm going to be real. Um, I know Travis. Travis is actually a big Amina supporter. Uh, he really likes her. Um, but I actually have not seen an Amina stumble. I've played with a lot of Aminas. And she's always actually done something. Do you remember the all threes uh, run? Yeah, and, but like, yeah, she like, I think everyone stumbled on that one. That yep. was part of like the meme, but she <laughs> did still like get stuff done. She contributed for sure. Yeah, yeah it, I, I recently played with uh, another player on my channel who played Amina. I played Marie just so we could do the whole Doom thing. Granted, it was Dream Eater, so Easy we, we won. Um, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it wasn't that she was just sitting around doing nothing. Yep. Like that's sometimes the discourse makes it sound like they have nothing to contribute to, to, to the game state. Yep. And that's, that's crazy. Yeah. Like to me, like stumbling is like, when I look at like a bad investigator, like that's stumbling, I think of like corset schizo tool where it made me almost want, Oh, I was playing Arkham with Eric the first time Eric and I played ages ago back in like 2017. Yeah. And I played as pair, a, a regular core skids. Eric played Daisy and I only had one core set and I played skids and I was just like, eh, do I actually hate this game? Like, is this game actually bad? And like, or like the first time we played Lola with a limited collection with just Carcosa, Dunwich and core. And we were like, wow, she's awful. Amina has not hit those levels because the player card pool is really good. Yeah. All right. Last bit from this section and uh, just to, to wrap things up about you as a player, 
what do you get the most fun out of? You talked about being a spike winning, but is there anything more than that? Um, so the two things I like the most right now is I like restricting myself and seeing if I can break that restriction and win. Um, it's certainly more fun playing with two people and doing that as opposed to playing two handed solo. Um, but luckily, uh, cause I'm currently going through the gauntlet two, which is building with a very limited collection of only three sets per investigator. Um, and I'm went through Forgotten Age, which is always the low point for challenge runs. I mean, as we also know with our Yithian challenge, it's very difficult with challenge runs. But the thing I like most is trying to squeeze out wins from challenges. Like, I like to take my card pool and see what I can do with it. Like, so, for example, recently that Father Mateo deck I brought through our Circle Undone cycle draft. And then also, like, that Sister Mary deck. Um, in the Carcosa one, which was like, I'm going to build a support sister Mary. And it actually just like popped off. Um, that's kind of like what I really enjoy. But my favorite part of the game is preparing for the next mythos phase and solving the mythos phase that was given to me. Um, my least favorite mythos phases are the ones where nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like some sort of puzzle that has to be solved because that's kind of like what this game is it's a puzzle every round and how can i solve it and that's what i enjoy most yeah i agree that, that part of what i was going to ask next uh and maybe i know the answer but so a lot of people get fun out of the story out of the narrative experience that is you know the arkham universe itself um what are your thoughts on that i think it's totally cool uh it's part of the reason why i think this game had such a good selling point um, I like, uh, my personal preference is the emergent narrative, um, where it's the narrative that happens from the gameplay as opposed to the reading. Um, so like, I, I totally understand it, but the less I need to actually like pick up a card and read, mm -hmm. um, the more in, uh, the more I enjoy actually doing it because there's a lot of stories that do pop up as you're playing the game. Um, that, uh, is my, is the thing that I enjoy most for that kind of thing. I think, but I think like, if you like the narrative, like you want to like, um, like role play your character a bit like that. I think that's like totally sick as hell. Um, but I kind of like the jokes that come from it naturally, or like, I, that's the kind of like, I like the, I, I like that kind of thing. I mean, big butt baby is an example of it that um is now warped into it and now it's like i just see people on the internet just calling him big butt baby and i'm like yep. that's crazy right <laughs> that yeah. i mean like i said you your channel is the entry point for a lot of people mm -hmm. and uh what you say matters <laughs> it's, it's as <laughs> weird as it is to say that out loud right yeah. or to hear it uh but that's where it comes from um i i know a lot of people who like the the uh the arkham universe narrative too and want to role play, but I think it's sometimes just as fun and they enjoy it as well when you, I don't want to say role play per se, although it's happened on your, your channel, but putting weird cards in your deck and then trying to explain what they're doing there. So yeah, even if you're yeah. just going to say, oh, I'm going to play sled dogs in edge of the earth, that's where it makes sense. You know, what also is funny to have a pack of sled dogs go with you through uh, the jungle, right? <laughs> it's yeah. I think it's and, a strength and of the that's kind of like that's like the like when I like the emergent storytelling on like the player side, um, I think is really enjoyable because of those reasons, right? Where like, um, why is Bryn sliding around on these sled dogs in the jungle? Is Lily Chen, right? Mm -hmm. Or like Leo Anderson as Bryn when he uh, gets the tree hands, right? Like those those kinds of things I think are really, really fun to see play out. Uh, I don't think anyone can forget who has watched that run. Uh, where Trish pulled out the other Norman Withers uh, yes, mini yep, card, right? Yep. yep. And Bryn's like a, a pro at that kind of thing. Like he's he's very good at um, coming up with like funny jokes like that. And then there's also like, I mean, the they they hated it when I first brought it up. But even just like the the in the the running joke of the miasma in Edge of the Earth calling it ice milk, like that. Like at first they were like, "What are you talking about, Justin?" But now we all call it that. Like <laughs> that's the kind of stuff that I, that I personally like, and that comes from when we used to play in Eldritch Horror, and when Charlie Kane killed a vampire once, uh, and that's the Charlie Kane Vampire Hunter that 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 came from our channel. Just like that. That's the kind of thing that like I really. Um, like and why we've been like Travis Brent and I have played these Arkham Files games for as long as we have. 
And when MJ released the Charlie Kane yep. uh, images, they were titled Vampire yeah, Hunter. Kane Vampire Hunter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that was a that was because I, I um I try not to. Uh, I've never reached out to anyone at uh, FFG about like doing an interview or anything on the channel. I've always thought about it, right? But I, I like the the wall where it's just like I'm over here in my zone, right? Like, and you're over here in your zone, and we're trying to just like show off this game together as best as we can mm -hmm. well i mean you need each other i honestly i think they all watch uh some amount of of the uh discourse i'm sure hopefully not all of it but they have to they like the game too right they're fans oh yeah yeah they do yeah all right so let's turn our attention a little bit more towards the experiences uh, through playthroughs that you've had of the game and what you've learned from them so you alluded to this earlier uh, a couple years ago you did a play all investigators challenge and then last year you did a play all cards challenge so what's something that even a couple years later you've learned or so stuck with you from those challenges so the play all investigator challenge didn't teach me too much uh it was just kind of like a growth of like oh this investigator i haven't played in a while but the play all card challenge was actually formative it was like um it took my brain and changed it into entirely new shape when it came to how I approached Arkham Horror the card game. And I did not expect that to happen. I just thought, this is a fun challenge. Why don't we try some things and see what's like, you know, it's it's content, right? Like that's kind of like what the start of that was. It was just like, it's content. People are going to be like, this guy's playing every card this year. <laughs> um, but what came out of it was so much discovery about Arkham Horror. Um, this was an example where I brought it up on a list video uh, and Travis and Bryn were both like, they like, and I got made fun of in the, in the, in some of the YouTube comments too. And on our discord, they're like, I can't believe Justin said that, but I said, not every deck should play Faustian bargain, right? Like, um, yeah, which is like, uh, it's one of those things where you should find your economy in different ways because economy is actually asking like economy is, is not just, how can I pay for cards in my deck? Economy is how can I pay for cards in my deck that is the best way for that deck? Mm -hmm. I've seen so many people play Faustian Bargain, uh, take the resources for themselves. Like, I mean, also I think people should be splitting Faustian money more often because that I think is actually like the real selling point of the card. But then they end the scenario with eight resources, right? Like they didn't need those five resources they got from Faustian Bargain. They were just sitting there. They played it because it's there. Um, so it's like asking yourself, is this card actually the correct choice for my deck in terms of what the deck's goal is? And that was just a huge discovery. And now like, I actually don't even play Faustian Bargain that much anymore. Uh, this was part of another thing of like finding um, uh, it's something I've been saying on the channel a lot, which is like active versus inactive economy, right? And there was a lot of discoveries in that for me where active economy is better. Uh, and actually, it's one of those things that, like, now, even though it's boring as sin, I always go to Emergency Cash 2 because it replaces itself, right? Mm -hmm. And that's so much more valuable than, for me, like, those two extra resources. And, like, that, like that, that's kind of the thing is, like, ask me looking at every player card and being like, when do I need this? Like, years ago, before I did the Play All Card Challenge, if I look at that Father Mateo deck that I just released that I played through the, the Circle Undone, I probably wouldn't have looked at the Eldritch Inspiration card or whatever it is, the one that allows you to double up or cancel a symbol, right? Mm -hmm. But now I was like, this card's purpose is this deck, right? And I'm more easily able to identify when I would try something like that as opposed to just being like, uh, this is a mystic deck. I need to play Holy Rosary. Or even the craziest thing is not running allies sometimes because some player cards are actually better than just having an ally in this slot just because an ally should be one of the cards in your deck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just even seeing what these other cards do and finding homes for them to some extent, right? And I know that you're playing the cards not in the first place to do that, uh, but just to, to put them into a deck and, and get some value out of them. But now actually, yeah, you're right. Later on, you have a new appreciation looking at these cards again when you don't have those restrictions or not trying to just play everything. Do you know how many cards there there were in the card pool at the time? I can check. I have my spreadsheets. Sure. 979. Oh my God. Yeah. That... yeah, I don't know if I could ever redo that challenge. It was very tough. It was fun watching your your check-ins and seeing how what percentage... You'd completed. Yeah, 
because it was like the whole I, I remember yeah during the updates and there was that period in the summer where i was like i made two percent progress right. this is not going to finish yeah the 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 downtime where i was like this is not happening <laughs> but you got there in the end and that's what's important yeah yeah but i just think like especially like it, the next time i do it drown city would be out but you know never say never there's always a need for more content that's right all right so the next yeah. question since you've been playing for so long and you kind of mentioned a few things about your your valuation changing or at least giving new eyes to these other cards um how about just of particular cards themselves is there something about the game or about a card that you pride yourself on having gotten right and then on the reverse side something that you've humbly changed your mind about yeah so this one, I actually uh, had to look back because I didn't actually do a lot of analysis until Edge of the Earth, which is kind of crazy because we've been making content since the early days. Uh, actually, yeah, but like Edge of the Earth is when we started to like actually be like, hey, we're going to talk about these cards. Because I mean, that makes sense. Like COVID is when Innsmouth was coming out. And like, that's when we started to actually like really focus on this as a channel. Mm -hmm. um, but the one that I'm most proud of is probably Thieves Kit. Um because I saw that card the first time and I was like, this card is incredible for rogues. It's Dr. Milan, first off. Like, it's a Dr. Milan for rogues. Um, and it benefits so much in terms of what rogues want to be doing. And there were a lot of people who were like, no, this card is also just kind of like, it's just like not great. Like, I don't see the value of this. But I think that card is, I'm not going to go on to like, be crazy and say it was revolutionary for the rogue class because in reality lock picks was revolutionary for the rogues class right when it was released but thieves kit i think is a very viable card that is now played most of the time over lock picks in a lot of decks yeah definitely i think people saw one or the other right yeah. like thieves kit was going to challenge lock picks but that's not the case right that that is yep. it's a different archetype in some sense yeah, and I think also a lot of people um, undervalued the way that you could also investigate with your foot because foot is what rogues do. Um, and like they'd opened up so many skills. Like going back to my active versus inactive thing, watch this and Thieves Kit is really good. It's very good. Uh, someone in some decks better than Faustian. You heard me, I'll say it. I'll say it. I I'd rather get a clue with my economy than just play my economy. Uh, another one was the masks. Um, I honestly thought I was taking crazy pills when I saw all the discourse around the masks when they were coming out, mm -hmm. because I was just looking at them and I was just like, I don't, I don't get it. Like, I don't, I don't get the people calling for like the taboos or that this card is going to break the game because I'm like, this is just like an unexpected courage, which is good. But I think the reality is, is that one, they are harder to fill up than people think. Mm -hmm. And two, most of the time you don't actually need them. Cause I've played like wolf masks and a lot of fighters decks. And by the time I'm set up, I'm like, look at this wolf mask in my hand. And I'm just like, I don't need this plus two anymore. Right. Um, uh, funnily enough, I actually think the strongest mask right now is the Fox mask. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's mostly because rogues care about succeeding by a lot. So they're actually going to use it when, um whenever as opposed to like everyone else where it's like i don't really need this extra boost with that said going back to my point about the play all card challenge i think there's homes for when it pops off more um for example like if you're playing the elders uh ability on the runic axe you want to put wolf mask in your deck right like it's like it's the one again it's like cards are better at certain times i think the idea of an auto include is going down smaller and smaller as the card pool grows i totally agree with that that I, I previewed one of the masks and got so much feedback that was just like, look, the card just came out. Like, play it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> play it first. Yeah. Yeah. They're good, but they're good. They're good. But like I think like they're I think it's a fair statement that they can be like a very easy forever one of, but I think putting two in your deck most of the time is like um run a toe to toe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> run, yeah. Something, run something that kills something or gets you a clue. And honestly, the this is a side comment, but people who complain about the fact that it doesn't take up a slot, so you can't replace it easily. Mm -hmm. This is another good reason why it's a level zero card, right? There's a little bit of a, a balance on it. I think that maybe it's an accident that the Carnivale mask had that text on it and the rules work that way, but mm -hmm. you're right. They don't fill up that easily and playing one over the other 
would probably put it a little bit make it a little bit too good in in in, in some circumstances yeah. and it's more fun and I mean, to... but then it also becomes one of those things where you can uh because you can't easily replace them like find a way to easily replace them like for example i built a parallel monterey jack that used joey the rat to sell my masks and exactly. play new masks and it was or, very fun or dexter who can kind of juggle a couple of masks yeah, or juggle them around yep exactly yeah I, I... uh some of my incorrect calls uh the biggest one i think is scout ahead um i thought that card was going to be a super staple but i actually think it's pretty bad um i think it's more niche like there's definitely times where you want to play it like you'd probably want to play it in carcosa if you don't have other like zooming transport but i think the reality is is just that like nimble exists and is better because it's active again which mm -hmm. is one of those things which is i think because like even just nimble like you like when i'm when i say active for people who don't know you're advancing the game while triggering the effect so there's a big difference between spending an action to move with three times the scout ahead versus using your thieves kit as a rogue with a nimble committed to move three things while also getting a clue right so like that's where um the the whole things were i think like the value of things changed on that kind of thing um another one was map the area and breach the door i think i really underappreciated what these effects can do uh, especially breach the door like i think map the area is, is is playable but i think breach the door is actually kind of sick <laughs> um in the right location it does so much like there was a time when i there's that location in um waking nightmare where you can spend three actions to investigate four times mm -hmm. um and you just breach the door on that location and it's grab all the clues it's just like really nice um a funny one too that I was also that I I can't believe I gave chemistry set a two point five, oh. <laughs> um, which I actually now like that's that if going back to the value upon value that card is just value on value it's insane. You've had some great success with that, and even when you don't hit on it, it's still kind of just fun to play, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's like with chemistry set a lot of people. Um, I think actually this is inherently an issue that a lot of people have just in life in general, if we want to get philosophical. Uh, they remember the times where it burst, busted on the first one, right? Um, and luckily I'm very good at not doing that. Um, and instead just, I like, it. Bu I, I actually had it recently. We, we were just recording an episode two weeks ago and it uh, I lost it on my first investigate action. And I was like, eh, what can you do, right? Because I know over overall, chemistry set has gotten more value than it has broken on the first first use or even second or third use right mm -hmm. and it's a level zero card right so how yep. much can you expect out of it reasonably now over the years they've not always gotten that right in my mm -hmm. opinion and probably yours too and it's pretty easy in hindsight of course after eight years um or just after playing with the cards um to nitpick a bit on the designers and for the cards for the scenarios and see where things have gone wrong we all do it it's part of what i think comes from being a player and, and having our own experiences but we wouldn't be still playing the game if it weren't so damn good as a whole so in your mind uh what impresses you about the game design that holds up to this day um i mean like the the campaigns are insanely good the campaigns are are nuts even ones that, I mean, I think uh, this is an example too, where everyone has their favorite campaign and a lot of the time it fluctuates between player to player, right? Um, I think the campaign stuff is unparalleled. I think also like a lot of people, um, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine where they rag on the official stuff compared to custom stuff, but custom stuff has a lot more time and the ability to edit. Mm -hmm. With official stuff, like they have to make it right the first time usually within a year right <laughs> like that's kind of like the window they have to work on this so it's an incredibly impressive and even though like uh there are misfirings like i personally don't enjoy um scarlet keys uh mostly just because i think the structure is a little bit borked um i think it's still the scenarios themselves they have a lot of impressive moments in them right um and uh yeah, like Edge of the Earth is a phenomenal campaign too that I think gets a lot more hate than it actually deserves because when you play it, you're like, wow, this is actually really fun. Uh, I think they continue to explore it really well. But I think the most successful thing that's happened, and I think Hemlock Vale is a good example of this, is that player card design has been really good um, in the sense of um, 
uh, coin, coin in a new concept here, everyone. This is where uh, I've been thinking about this for a while, but this is the, the first preview of this, of the design of what you can do with a card versus what the card does. Um, so I think that the design has been really good to be compelling because what you can do with it is a lot more interesting than a what you can do uh, card, uh, what it does card. So like an example of a what you can do with a card is like butterfly swords, right? There's so many different ways you can take this and try to make this pop off in a variety of ways versus let's just say Cyclopean hammer, which is what the card does. The card <laughs> hits things, right? It's yep. a lot more limiting, right? And I think the player card design has been very good at giving like pieces for you to look at and be like, what can I do with this? What, what does this card like do? And like even just task force as an example, right? Where on the tin, you look at it, you're like, this is what this does, like, but what can it actually do? And likewise with like testing sprint, where um, uh, I had the Kate thing, well, the, the Kate, Kate Winth pup, but I also, Brent and I already have recorded events only two. And that was a part of my deck and used it to great success, right? Like the card is like actually insane. There's a lot of different varieties you can do to approach it to really pop off with it. Uh, and I think that that is incredible. I think I, I didn't understand the people. I mean, once again, this is the perspective from the play all card challenge. But when there were so many people ragging on the Hemlock Veil spoilers as they were coming out, like looking at Grift and being like, why would I ever play this over Faustian Bargain or like Bank Job, right? Like, why does Rogue need more money cards? And the answer to that is the designers are actually very carefully and cleverly giving us tools that work in different ways for different investigators. With Grift, you could play a watch this on top of this. It's a test at zero, right? Which is another thing you can do with it. It lets you use Nimble. Bank Job is for a bigger burst clue or like, you know, like that kind of thing or like for example if you have um like a way to use your actions as a rogue right like the resources are really good or if you have some sort of event reduction all this kind of stuff that really can just like that's why they're doing it because it's there's different reasons you'd want to play these cards over one another and i think going back to the beginning of this interview they're designed for different kinds of players someone yeah. looks at something that is just obviously strong in most cases, right? That's going to be for some players. But if there's a player who wants to get some interesting value or combo with something else, maybe testing sprint is that card, right? So yep. they are doing their due diligence with a, a large card pool to design for different play styles and investigators too, which, I mean, it's interesting because the investigators do try to uh, attract different kinds of players, but even so, I think the depth of the game can be that uh, different kinds of players will play the same investigator in quite different ways. Yes, oh, 100%. I've seen so many different, like, I'm very privileged where I get to have a lot of people who want to play games, play Arkham with me. Um, and just, like, seeing different people bring the same investigators is really cool. All right. Last part of this is what is something that you would say, an opinion about the the game that might ruffle some more feathers or do you think that is just an unpopular in general uh this one was tough for me to be honest trying to think of this because um i have a we have a lot of opinions on the channel that i think while unpopular are like i think i mean like a big one is probably that we we as a group thought that uh xp was given out too freely in campaigns uh, i think they've actually brought they've they've come down on that though I think like uh, Hemlock and Scarlet are both on the lower side. Mm -hmm. uh, Innsmouth was just insanely high in the way that it was paced out. Um, but I, I, I dug deep to the thing that I've said in the past that has gotten the most people being like, what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> yes. And that is that I think that they should start taboo listing rule changes as well. And then they should make it so that when your deck cycles, you take a mental trauma. With some exceptions to Patrice. She's the only exception, actually. So one exception. Uh, because, like, it's a tool, it's a lever that exists for the character design. Um, when people point at the strength of the Seeker class, I think it's the fact that they have the card draw in their class, which is a huge mistake. I think that card draw should not be uh, a feature of a class, right? It should not be part of their pie. They shouldn't be better at it than others. I think card draw should just be flat, right? Um... So I think that that would be the my way to temper that. And I, I think that even in the early days, cycling was scary. Beyond the Veil and Dunwich, like mm -hmm. that was there to be a sign that this should be something that doesn't happen, right? You're being punished for it in a way. 
Uh, every time you mill cards, you're like, that beyond the veil is waiting for me around the corner. And I think there should be a similar risk in cycling through your deck. So cycling through your deck, I think, is its own topic for maybe some future mm -hmm. discussion. Um, but I find that's the big divide between people who are very much entrenched in card games and people who are just playing, uh, I'm not going to say just for the narrative, but they're not trying to play their deck versus the the game. They're they're there for the the scenario itself. Um, a lot of investigators don't ever cycle their deck. Yep. And if you're tr yep. not trying to, you probably won't. Yep. But I think a lot of players, um, and this is maybe my unpopular opinion, if that is what your goal is to just you know put half of your deck in your hand or in play and then go through it two more times. I, I think you're playing a different game than a lot of people are. Yeah. And yeah, and I think there should be some sort of um, punishment to the reward, right? Um, because I think the reward of it is really good. I think like it's a fun play style to do. I've enjoyed doing it. But at the same time, I think there should be like some sort of thing that makes it a bit harder. Mm -hmm. And then maybe, I mean, if they do that, they could just print like some horror healing, just make it so you have to work for it a little bit more, right? Right. Yeah, just uh, uh, put some ancient stones in your deck, and then uh... exactly right. Like, I mean, sometimes the solution is the problem, right? Like that's kind of like just how it goes. Um, but I think it would be a lot more interesting. Um, that's the, that's kind of my thought because you're right. If you, unless you're doing it, you're you're unlikely to cycle your deck, or if the scenario is trying to make you do it. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, my other unpopular opinion is people are too attached to their cards. Um, with like going back, like a heed the dream yeah right everyone was like i can't play this card because if someone takes one of my cards away i can't handle with it and i'm like i honestly this is this is i go outside and touch grass a lot i i'm very like chill with that kind of like i don't it's a card game right like your cards are there to be played or to be lost right just like if you lose the one card in your deck that you needed to win, I'm sorry, your deck might have been bad, right? Like, why do you only have one card? <laughs> you know I, mean? but that, I will say, in respect to this, my whole thing is the love of solving puzzles. So sometimes that puzzle is, what do I do if I just lost the card I needed to solve this puzzle? Mm -hmm. But that's just a whole new puzzle to solve, and that's what's really exciting. You must have loved Hemlock Vale with all of the discard from hand uh, treacheries. Oh. <laughs> yeah I, I mean i love that i love disruption like i i'm it's probably i mean i'm not gonna say this is an unpopular opinion because i think a lot of people would agree with this but i like it when the game the game is a player that's how i look at it the game is a player and that player is trying to win yep so like when the game hurts me i don't freak out about it i'm like you're trying to beat the me in this game and that's how this works i think but i i think in all fairness too uh, I've played a lot of competitive games in my life. So like losing is kind of just something that happens. Um, and I think if you haven't done a lot of that, it does hurt to, it does suck to lose Arkham, especially because I think they got rid of the fail forward that they used to have back in the day. Mm -hmm. This sort of goes back to, again, my, my comment about, I think people who are in the mentality of the competitive games, they're usually just playing against another player and your deck is the way you do it. But in Arkham, the scenario is what you're trying to accomplish right and playing your deck helps you do it i get that but losing your cards losing your uh stuff in play that is what the that's what the game is trying to do and it probably can't do it very well if it doesn't do that with some uh regularity because the card pool is so strong yep. and it is so much easier to play the game when you just get to sit there and set up your kit Yes. Yeah. Yeah. With regularity and ferocity. Mm -hmm. I think that like, I think that like, oh, like there's that one hemlock card, um, rainfall on day two Downpour, that yeah. like drops clues or takes actions, something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a great card. Like that card hits hard. Um, and it's a book test too. So like your fighters are like, I mean, but we're also on our channel. We're big proponents of spires of Carcosa. Mm -hmm. We love the idea that you need to be able to solve any problem that comes up. Um, or like at least have like an idea of how you're going to solve that problem. I really, we really enjoy that. It's it's a good lever that they should not shy away from, and I'm glad to see that in Hemlock that they they didn't. I think is a challenging campaign because and of also that. Like going to your uh, your points too, back to the hard hard expert. Like I would love if they were just like hard and expert was more like we're going to hurt you more. Like we're here to we're going to disrupt you more. Um, like in Lord of the Rings, the Living Card Game, there's a nightmare mode 
which has cards that are I'm sorry, there's like gold bordered cards um, that uh, if you can take them out for an easier experience, like instead it's like, here, put this in. And it just says surge, like discard two cards from your hand, right? Yeah. Like that is like, that's a nightmare, right? And that is kind of like what I view Harden Expert should be instead. All right, let's move on to just a very short finale of our interview, which is just some thoughts about your channel looking back over the past number of years. Uh, so the first one, I know you get this question a lot, but holy cow, you've not missed a day of publishing something Arkham related in how many years now? I don't even know, four years? Four years, something like that. That's, that's, that's crazy to me. I know it is your full-time gig, but how do you make so much stuff and at the same time not get burnt out? Like you're sitting here talking with me over an hour so far and you're just as excited about talking about the game as ever. Yeah. Uh, well, the big thing is I love Arkham. Like I actually do. This isn't just me doing, um, like lip service of a guy who is, um, being paid to play Arkham by, uh, awesome viewers, but I actually mean it. Like I actually do love playing Arkham. I get excited to play Arkham every time I'm going to play it with people. It's a little bit hard sometimes I will admit to play two handed, right? Like it is, it is a little bit harder to do that, but at the same time, if it was easy, it wouldn't be like work. And this is work for me. Like that's kind of what it comes down to. But like, for example, with that dog dreamers, I was like, just excited to play with um, Travis and Brent. Like I was just like, I couldn't wait for those first days. Eric and I playing dark matter has been really fun. You and I doing this Yithian challenge. Like I actually like look forward to it, even though it's, it's, it's been hell. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Like I, I love Arkham. That's the that's like the the most important thing. I, I enjoy playing this game as much as I did the first time. It literally was like the perfect game for me. Uh, number two, uh, I uh, before this I worked as a first AD uh, for film sets. That's the guy who is the first assistant director. You're basically organizing and running the film set. So organization is like my superpower. Um, so because of that, I'm very well organized in ensuring that I have things in like all my ducks in a row and it's because of that that i'm able to keep ahead of the schedule i work so far in advance mm -hmm. i have videos for our the gameplay um our gameplay stuff apart from fridays with travis and Bryn, i'm good until 2025 like people were like when is the eric dark matter going to start and i'm like probably january 2025 like i'm that far ahead in like moving uh, on things but that's just because that's the way my brain works for that kind of stuff and we're finally, for the first time in like a year, ahead on list videos. And I can't, I'm so happy because we've been doing for the longest time list videos week by week, but we're ahead. So that's great. Um, but that's kind of like the thing I'm, I'm like just planning and working ahead is how I'm able to, to keep ahead, ahead of that, all that. If you haven't seen the video that Justin posted last December or so, that was a here's what I do and how I do it with the notebooks and everything, it's worth a watch just out of curiosity if nothing else because it's uh i mean what you do is amazing i i don't work that much ahead of schedule obviously i'm not doing this for my full-time job but um i i find it hard to uh come up with ideas even and i only publish a few things a week and the fact that you have a, an endless fountain of of stuff to publish about is incredible yeah you it's it goes through waves right now we're in a hard this is hard like trying to figure out our sunday videos because sundays are usually our variety days where i try to do something fun for the audience like that's when we did family feud last week mm -hmm. uh it's becoming hard like this is like the hard point where it's like no new parallels no new um cards spoiled um we're not doing any like guide series right now. So like, it's kind of just open. Like there are times where it's tough to come up with content. I'm not going to like pretend that it's, oh, I have a million ideas brewing for that. Um, a lot of it is very, I wake up in the morning and I'm just like standing in the shower, just like, what the hell do I talk about today? Right. <laughs> um, but luckily drowned city is about to start doing some stuff. Um, we're very likely to see a taboo list soon, which is going to be two weeks of videos I got to do my Hemlock re-review, right? So it's like kind of like, once again, like thinking ahead, like right now is the Dark Ages, um, but it's going to get better. And fingers crossed that we get the announcement on the what's changing to the product line mm -hmm. because I'm optimistic and hopeful that they want to fill those slots that were the reprints with other uh, releases, which honestly would be like um, seeing God descend from the heavens for a channel like this because it means that just like constant releases to talk about which is huge for engagement huge for the community and selfishly it's huge for me <laughs> yeah once per year 
for releases is tough. I mean, but it is like, uh, because we were talking about this, someone on the the Patreon recently, where it's once per releases for enfranchised players. But for new players, they were still getting something like every four months, right? Or every three months, right? So like, that's huge for them. But for us, who has everything and seen this all, it's a little bit slow for sure. Mm -hmm. So I just have to like, I have to like remind myself and put that into perspective where now hopefully maybe I'd love like to do two releases a year. We'll see. We'll see. I don't know. We'll see. We will get a new parallel at the end of this month, though. We do know that. Yeah, so. Should we shoot our shot? Should we each take a guess right now? Who? We think yeah, it's sure. Be? All right. You first. I mean, it's got to be a guardian, right? <laughs> Could be. But the thing is, they they threw it for loot. We now have three. Like, they, right. g- they gave us an extra rogue, right? Because yeah. Jenny and and Monterey Jack. So, could be a guardian if they go. Right. Ne- I'm gonna I'm gonna call my shot. I'm gonna say it's Danielle. I think they're doing the Edge of the Earth ones. All right, I'm going to go out of left field then, and I will say a parallel Calvin. Ooh, that'd be fun. Is this stemming from that conversation in the Discord about the Calvin that reacts to auto fails? Yeah. yeah, that would be really sick. Yeah, that, would be really sick. <laughs> that was a fun idea, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, so going back to your, your content and videos, is there something that uh, you're incredibly proud of that maybe, well, two things, yeah, just a video or video series that you're proud of, of working on and how it turned out and then also something that you really like that you don't think people have uh watched enough of or maybe just mm-hmm. didn't get picked up on by the algorithm um so the stuff that i'm most proud of is probably whenever i actually get to do editing um i don't do it too often because we release seven videos a week right um but like the most recent father mateo video where it was actually like the edited um video essay style I really enjoyed that one. If you go to our shorts tab on our channel, there's one about deduction. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> a one minute long short. I love that video. Uh, another one is the one where we, um, where I played that game where you had to make something out of nothing, like that, like a magic craft. And I made Arkham Horror out of um, earth, wind, fire, and water, right? That's right. Yeah. Like, that was that was an experience, and it was edited to be like a tight twenty four minutes from like a two and a half hour vod. Um, if I can, I don't know when this video is coming out, but there's a video with Eric and I that's coming out um, during the um, week of Arkham Horror um, mm-hmm. that I'm very excited for everyone to watch. Um, if it, this comes out after that, well, it's already out there, so you can go watch it. <laughs> this will be out in about a week yeah. after we we recorded it. Nice, nice. Um. And then there is uh, my personal favorite stuff to record um, is the investigator tier list retrospectives. Um, uh, As much as I love organization, I also love data. (laughs) So like being able to see the trends of how investigators rankings are going is super sick. Uh, I like seeing like how me, Brennan, Travis have changed up or down over the years, how we've leveled out with each other, how we've gone apart from each other. That's the kind of stuff I really like. Uh, as opposed to underviewed, um, realistically, no, because most of the stuff I actually know when it's going to hit. Mm. Um, there was one, so we, we just did Guardian Week, uh, and there was the one we did at the end, which was the history of the Guardian class. And I thought it underperformed, uh, but then I looked at it and it actually like has legs and it's like still getting views to this day. So I was going to say that one, but then I checked and that one actually is pretty pretty solid because that one the 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 ones that were like travis and i have to make the video together those always take a, a good chunk of time family yeah. feud also like that one i know that one's new but that one also did really good so it's you very that funny one. i mean I, I so i think the next step is i'm actually going to add some competition i think i want to get like you and someone else as a family to like do a run of it and then also get travis and Brynn and actually score it i think that could maybe add some more stakes to it which could be fun that would be fun so that just brings me to the last bit which is what are you looking forward to from your channel and then also the game in the future oh the game i mean i'm just excited i'm excited for cthulhu um i'm excited drown city's pitch seems really cool like that 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 campaign seems really cool um I, i i think the thing i'm most excited about was the change of designers not that i think that like the game needed a change of designers i do think that like mj was still like bringing the heat the player cards and scarlet keys were really cool edge of the earth player cards were really cool uh i like i said the scenarios and the campaigns are really nice um but 
I often do this where I point to why Magic the Gathering is successful. And the reason for that was differently designers on sets. So you got like a new perspective. And I think we already see some that bearing fruit of what these new perspectives can bring to it. So I think that's kind of like what I'm most excited about. A new design team that um like like play like played the game to designers, right? Like like uh while I don't really um partake in too much Arkham outside of uh like basically yours and my channel. I, I don't basically do too much because I, I think about it too I don't need more of it. But like uh Nick the designer, he used to be on Mythos Busters, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Like that's a fan that would be like I, I don't want this, but like if it's like if I was uh suddenly became one of the designers in Arkham, right? The reason I don't want it is because I suck at it. Like I suck <laughs> at designing cards. Um but like um that is really cool to see and that's like really exciting and already uh his design of marion is like i'm gonna say inspired like i i just think like this whole thing is a change of designers is really cool and like that's awesome for the game like that's incredible and that's like the thing i'm most excited about yeah uh, and like now that they have a bigger team like I, I I don't know how FFG works, but it would be cool if there was like a different head designer who was just like, I'm in charge of this this box, right? Like this is me. Uh, but I imagine they seem to be more like community focused for how they they do their designer uh, designs for it. But yeah, and, I and, love I love that. And maybe that the scenarios themselves are li uh, led by a particular designer. Yes. I think right? yeah, yeah, which is really I think like really really, yeah. Uh, I know um, Walid. Channel. Oh, sorry. I know Walid is one of the designers and uh, new designers. Um, and it's it's Duke, Nick, and Walid, and I I'm pretty sure Walid is the one who designed uh, Parallel Monterey Jack, which I also think is a, a huge win in design. So yeah. I like what I'm seeing too. Yeah, it's I I think that's just kind of like when it comes down to and like going to back to what I talked about how I think a lot of the recent player card design has been really good. Uh, this it's going to sound like an insult, but it's not. The design is very flat, um, which means that there's like there's no card in my opinion, like Cyclopean Hammer in, um, or in the thick of it, which I think are two issues <laughs> in like that kind of thing. I think that there's like, it's a lot more like tight for that. Mm -hmm. And I think everything we've seen for um, Drowned City is, is really cool. Yeah. But I, I do think this game has more legs than the community lets on. Um, uh, as, as example of all the custom content that exists. Um, so, like, I think that this is, it's, I'm not going to say something as, as hyperbolic as, like, this is, like, the just the beginning of Arkham Horror, right? Um, but I do think that there is a lot more to explore. Um, and I think it would not be the end of the world if they even revisited um, Ancient Ones they've already done. Mm -hmm. um, I do want them to stop making Ancient Ones. Like, I, I'm glad that we got, like, the color uh, in Hemlock and Cthulhu. Uh, there's just so many cool ancient ones that I think they can explore. There's Shudamel, there's the Thugwa, right? There's the mm -hmm. I want them to go to Canada. Yep. Please come to the Pacific <laughs> Northwest, please, right? Um, yeah. But I think for our channel, the thing I'm most excited about, whew, I don't even know. <laughs> I'm honestly, I'm just excited to release another video this week and, and have people be like, thanks for the video. That's the kind of stuff that I like. Well, selfishly, I'm excited for just you're more uh contributors to your your gameplay i think it's it's fun uh i think adding in eric at the beginning of was this year last year gosh it's been actually a while yeah, it was now. last year it was last, year, last yeah. year um was huge i mean nothing against uh travis and bryn they're very cool and nothing against yourself because you were also very cool to watch but um getting a rotating cast is is fun yeah yeah because like yeah you and i did just did the sealed Mm -hmm. And I mean, like now uh, we've recorded so much. I think we have like a day that we can poke each other and be like, "Hey, do you want to do something?" Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and your stuff with the uh, the beard also really yeah, cool. Beard, yeah, on uh, that's going to be starting uh, this week on the channel probably. By the if this is coming out this uh, next week, this is also uh, Circus X Mortis with beard should be starting right away soon. Too. Awesome. Yeah, I think that it, it it makes the channel a little bit more. I don't want to say community oriented because it's always been that way with especially with your your uh, your Patreon, but um. Not everyone sees Arkham beyond what you post. I think that highlighting other people and perspectives and having them talk about something that's cool is is good for the community as a as a large and helps uh, improve our player base.
Yeah. And it's like, um, I, uh, have always been someone who's kind of just like sticks in my lane. Um, and like, I'm just, I'd like nose down, <laughs> grind out content. But uh, I also agree that I think that it's, it's better for this channel, but also just like everyone else's too, that like, if the more crossovers, I mean, collaboration is the, is the, the non nineties term for it. <laughs> crossovers for like the tv show from the 90s but um it's like that kind of thing right where it's like um it's it it's great because i i, I do sometimes feel like um i should kind of get more people involved because of that right like because there's a lot of people making great arkham content um and maybe like too focused just on my own stuff might not be the way to go in the future, which is exciting. It is fun because, yeah. I mean, I got to do this interview for the yeah. first time. It's been so excited to just talk about my thoughts on Arkham without like having to be like, hey, everybody, here's a video for playing board games, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. No, um, but other part of it I think is, is awesome is that it's nice to put, have conversations with people and not just sort of, I don't want to say see you on, on as a video that's a, uh, kind of abstract sometimes um mm -hmm. and people themselves can be reduced a lot to just uh, comment on on a youtube uh video that doesn't show a lot of depth but talking with you playing with you um i mean i feel like i already knew you before <laughs> we started doing this but um it's added so much more because you're a real person now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that i think yeah. that's, that's i'm that's not good just to like a soundboard that says <laughs> big butt baby big butt baby I <laughs> <laughs> all right well this has been a lot of fun justin thank you so much for spending some time with me and, and just chatting about all kinds of stuff regarding your your own play style and what you've learned from the game and experiences i hope a lot of people have learned something uh, i have and it, it's just fun to talk arkham sometimes so if you enjoyed this kind of thing you subscribe to justin's channel to mine patreon obviously a thing uh let us know what you like about what we do and we will do more of that too because it's not just we want to please all of the their viewers but it's also that we want to know what works and yep. there, there's a lot of things that we throw at the at the algorithm and getting some feedback to tell us what you want more of we probably we're not going to ever do something that we don't like doing ourselves so uh yeah <laughs> that's that's a huge part of it so if you want to see more content like this i'm sure we could drum up another bunch of questions sometime in the future because i'd like to do it again yeah, I'd, I'd definitely be down. All right, that's it. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.